Well, good morning. We don't want to take a, about 30, 40 minutes of your time and express to you what evolutionization has done to our culture and to our church. If we have any hope for revival in our lifetime, in this earth, in this country, in this city, it'll be because we return to an absolute faith in the authority of Scripture, and that is transferred into our neighborhoods, our blocks, our cities, our states, specifically our families. The phenomenon in the average American family day is that we're losing our sons and daughters at age 15 to secular humanism and evolutionary thinking by the time they reach 15. Seventy percent of our teenagers <clears throat> are abandoning biblical Christianity. And we recognize that if we are to survive as a viable group in the United States of America, it will require an absolute truth base in the authority of Scripture. After having studied this probably 35 years now, I'm totally convinced that the intrusion of Darwinism into the world is probably... I'm not totally prepared to stake my reputation as a man of God or an, as a preacher of the gospel on this, but I'm pretty convinced now, about 75%, that Revelation 12.9 and its parenthetical relationship or statement that completely is out of sync with the rest of that chapter. It says that old serpent called the devil and Satan, here's the parenthesis, which deceives the whole world was cast out in his holy or his angels with him. So the deception of the whole world has become the agenda of Satan. And in order to deceive the whole world, you have to include the United States of America. So I believe that this didn't become a legitimate intent that was identified by the Creator in fact, when Adam lost his place as having the dominion of this earth, that dominion was given to Satan. And from that point far, Genesis 3.15, there's been a war going on. And the amount of war is directly related to the amount of our faith in the authority of Scripture. Amen. And so Darwinism has become a tool of Satan. I believe it's a last day effect. I believe this is one of the greatest prophecies of the nearness of the coming of Jesus Christ that there is in the Scripture. The rise of an evolutionary Darwinism. Now, I've been all over the world, or many parts of the world. I've been to Russia eight different times. I've been to the Philippines 60-plus days speaking in their schools. I spoke for the ACSI in their uh, South American convention for their school teachers and in the Asian convention. And I've discovered that the real problem in Christian education, especially in America, I know more about it than the United States or anywhere else, but the real problem is teaching a, a biblical worldview in a scientific context because Darwin has intruded into the notion of science as being the accepted model for how we explain origins. It's everywhere. When I prepared to speak to the International Conference of Science, Philosophy, and Theology at Dubna, Russia, at the uh, College for Nuclear Studies, the head of that department leaned over the table in my last organizational meeting. I went there three times one summer just to meet that organizing committee because I was the first American to participate in that, in that uh, convention. He leaned over and he looked me right in that white in my eye, and he was the lead theologian for the Russian Orthodox Church. And he said to me, Dr. Sharp, when you come and present your paper here, be careful what you say about Charles Darwin, because we still like him here. So a block and a half down from the Kremlin in the, in the uh, Russian uh, Moscow library, state library, who should you see a 32-foot bust walking in the main doors of the library but Charles Robert Darwin? And so I'm telling you that communism and fascism 
and all godless enterprise in the modern era has been based in Darwinism. It, it required a Darwinistic view to life and politics and government and science and educational delivery and all that in order to force the authority of the scripture out of the, of the culture to allow these ideas to be established. And so there's only two ways. There's either a biblical way and a non-biblical way. There isn't any other ways. Amen. That's the end of that. And so having said that, I want to talk to you this morning about Darwinism and the decline of the Bible. Darwinism has always been a or the. It was a uh, default position for atheism until it became so entrenched in the culture and the a was removed, the article was transitioned to the. Darwinism is the default position for atheism. In the National Academy of Sciences, our most prestigious scientific organization in the United States, a review was done of that organization in 1997, and it was uh, identified by self-identification that 92% of that organization were Darwinistic, Marxist, and atheistic. And so, is it any wonder that the college is used as a default worldview organization to take the minds of your young people out of the authority of Scripture. So it's a real challenge to send children to school, to state schools, because they are the purveyors of this nonsense. So the church is in a real hassle, because we've been convinced in the last 75 years that in order to be successful, you need to send your children to undergraduate school. Don't you? Do you think that? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, we do. And because we do, we send them to the greatest worldview purveyor in our nation. So we have become Darwinistic as a nation because science has embraced this idea and rejected creation as if it's a tortured religious system. The tragedy is there's just as much scientific support for biblical creationism as there is for evolutionism. And evolution is just as religious as creation is religious. So what we're talking about here are two gigantic worldviews. We're not talking about science. This has nothing to do with science. The greatest deception of the 20th and 21st century is that Darwinism found its place in the scientific context. That's a demonic intrusion. That's the hijacking of science for the deliberate dumbing down of the American and the world populations to the deception that he has to have and he has to control on the earth for the introduction of Antichrist. I am totally convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that Darwinism is the precursor to Antichrist. That's what I think. So, you know, Paul said that. I guess I'm in good company. He said, this is not God speaking, this is Paul. So I'm saying, this is Tom Sharp, not God, but I totally believe that that's how I see things, and I believe I can justify that with all kinds of evidence, which I will attempt to do this week. Any system of philosophy or philosophical thought that denies the total sovereignty of the Bible's creator God is an atheistic and anti-biblical system. If it deals with origins in particular, it's very anti-biblical. And its purpose is not advancing your thinking. Its purpose is dumbing you down to reality. And so we've been in a great dumbing down process. The thing that disturbs me, ladies and gentlemen, is there's a lot of people sitting in this audience that are very evolutionized. I have people come to me after I present things like this and say, but what about? Or, but what about? Well, what about that? You know, what are you going to do with... Uh, a day with the Lord is a thousand years. The problem is there isn't a verse like that. Okay, that, that's just an assumption we have. What are you going to do about uh, the evolutionary accounting for time? What are you going to do about carbon-14? Well, what am I going to do about carbon-14? We'll talk about that this week. Does carbon-14 dating actually justify billions of years? Does it justify any amount of time that you can superimpose on the Scripture? Have we learned anything scientifically that denies the authority of the Bible? Is that true? Can you really let your feet down and rest on the authority of the Word of God? Is, is that scientifically viable? American history since 1850 reveals that the Bible has been 
incrementally and continuously replaced by an aggressive evolutionism used to define and explain all aspects of reality. And this is what makes this worldview so incredibly dreadful, is because it's reaching for that center in your think tank that controls how you plan your life and how you prepare your life and what, what you spend your money on and where you go as an individual. Amen. Evolutionism is not just about a, a silly scientific notion that life arose from non-life. That is uncontestable. That is unconscionable that there would be any idea or anyone embrace the notion that life could arise from some uh, slime pool by a strike of lightning. Uh, you see, when, when they say those kind of things, what they don't tell you is, how did the pool get there, and how did the proteins and the amino acids get there in the first place? They never start at the beginning. They try to explain things and assuming that things are already there. And so I'm saying to you, uh, there's nothing wrong with the Word of God. But right out of Darwin's book, On the Origin of Species, he wrote on page 459 in my copy, When I view all beings not as spatial creations, some people allege that Darwin was a classical theistic evolutionist to some degree. I don't agree with that, because right in the conclusion of his Origin of Species, he identified this all the way back to creation or to the beginning. He said, when I view all beings not as spatial creations, that's how did they get here, okay? Not why species arose, but how did they get here in the first place? But as a lineal descendant of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Silurian system was deposited. He didn't have any idea what he's talking about. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, right before the great prophet of God, I think, Henry M. Morris passed back in the middle 90s. He, no, I'm sorry, back in 2006, he came to me or called me and he said, Dr. Sharp, as you go forward speaking these things, be careful to always talk about the definitions of death from an evolutionary perspective, from a biblical perspective, because the debate today is about how you view death. The evolutionist views death as something dies that's lesser fit for survival, giving rise to something more sophisticated and more progressive. And so death becomes a mechanism for development. But the Bible says death is not a mechanism for developmental kinds of ideas. Death is the result or the curse of sin. And so it's all about how you view death. From, the, from famine and from death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals. So progress comes from death. The Bible says death was the curse of Adam's sin. It's diametrically opposed but higher animals directly follows. There's grandeur in this view of life. Yes, that takes uh, accountability away from human nature. That allows us to live free and loose. Thumb your nose at the Bible. Go swimming on Sunday morning. Forget about communion. Forget about the cross and the shed blood of Jesus Christ because that's just a fanciful notion for some poor folks that don't know any better. And the, the, demographic or the demographics and the demographers, I should say, and the prognosticators of our modern culture are still telling us, and it's really boiling now around this election, that the common man who's simple and uninformed was the difference in this election. Really? Who is the common man? I would suggest to you that there's no man on the earth that is not common. <laughs> Commonality has nothing to do with your education or the amount in your bank account. Everybody is naked before God with whom they have to do. We're all standing in need of a Savior, whether we know it or not. Amen. I'm so glad I said that. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so he said, there's grandeur in his view of life. While this planet has gone on cycling according to the fixed laws of gravity, so simple a beginning with endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been our being evolved. And so that's right out of Darwin's book, and that's the war I want to make this week. And here is the answer to that war. The Apostle Paul told the Colossian church, a Roman church in a Greek city who had been terribly influenced by Greek philosophy, Paul fought against 2nd century B.C. evolutionists, Epicurus and Zeno, in his 
uh, tussle with the Areopagites on Mars Hill. Those were evolutionary philosophers that sat there on that hill, you know, talking about all the things they didn't know. We exercise ourselves in this futility. We talk about things we don't know anything about. And one is, of course, the origin of the universe. And so Paul said, beware. That word is very uh, mild in an English translation of the Greek word blepo. It's far more serious than that. It's only used a couple times in the New Testament. It means, uh, some say take heed, but that's kind of uh, meaningless and lipid doesn't say anything. The only way to understand the word beware is to understand what Paul is doing. And I illustrate this week after week like this. So you're at the church, and you're dusting the furniture or whatever. Uh, you're making room for dinosaurs to, on the platform, which is a, a unique addition to the platform. And so you've got your granddaughter, your grandson, and you're, you're singing and whistling or whatever, and you get involved, and all of a sudden your grandson or granddaughter leaves the building unnoticed by you, and you realize they're missing in a few minutes, and you run to the front door only to see them entering the street in the presence of oncoming traffic, and you're frightened beyond your ability to control yourself, and your lips turn white, and your brow knits together, and your muscles taunt, and you scream at the top of your voice, Stop! Because if the vocal command doesn't stop them, they're dead. That's the nature of this word. Paul is telling the Colossian church, if you don't stop... If you allow man, and the word man is anthropos, it doesn't mean male or female, just any person, spoil you. That's an old word translated spoil in King James. And I use King James not because Paul used it, okay? I use it because that's what I used when I was growing up. So I memorized more scripture out of King James than the other translations, so I continue using it. So forgive me for that impropriety. Beware lest any man spoil you. It means it's salagoyao. It means to be victimized as the booty of war. Beware lest any person pick you up and haul you off under their arm as the booty of war. How? Through philosophia, through philosophy, through the love of wisdom. And so preparing your children, your young people, to become professionals in this world where they compete for a living, they have to go to these institutions of higher learning in many instances where in some instances they're specifically inundated with this notion that biblical creationism is a fanciful superstition, has no bearing in any scientific context. And so they can be very, very influenced and carried away by these spoilers. These, they can be victimized by these, these intelligent uh, prognosticators that pick them up off of their feet and carry them away as booty of war. I have seen that happen over and over and over in the last 50, uh, three or four years of my preaching experience. After vain deceit, that means void of truth. What is more void of truth, ladies and gentlemen, than telling someone that 3.8 billion years ago, lightning struck a tide pool outside some ancient volcano, exciting the coacervates into some kind of a replicating system until eventually amino acids were produced, and then they homogenize, you know, into like kinds until eventually some hairy creature crawled out on the bank and lived under a flat rock for a million years, after which it got terribly tired of that lonesome environment. It climbed a tree and ate bananas a while until it decided it wanted to go to J.C. Penney and get a suit of clothes, and it went down to the University of Mississippi and started teaching philosophy. <laughs> That's void of truth. I mean, I can't believe that the philosophy professors at any state university even believes that to be real. But that's what they think. That through philosophy and vain, de vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So in this context, we want to talk about this. And uh, I, I, I have a few more minutes. The abandonment of the Bible on any basis or, or for any reason, okay? The abandonment of the Bible... Whether you think there's scientific evidence against the authority of Scripture, if you'll just wait a minute before you jump ship, just pause. Because the devil's been after the authority of Scripture for time immemorial. 
And so if you feel there's any basis why you think you can prove or disprove the authority of Scripture, hold it just a minute because you'll find out there'll be something revealed in a few days that will completely refute what you thought justified your abandonment. That's the nature of human understanding. So the abandonment of the Bible as the Word of God on any basis or for any reason always produces the closing of the mind. And America generally has closed their mind. We're living in a nation of closed minds. And I predict that we have so advanced in the closing of our minds with regard to the authority of the Bible, and I predict that we have so advanced in the closing of our minds with regard to the authority of the Bible that we could easily be that generation called as it was in the days of Noah, the, the antediluvian repeat. We're in that period where we're living before a great, catastrophic, redemptive explosion. The people of God are going to leave, and the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket. And that's exactly what I see, the position that we are today. People are so deceived today that they cannot be saved. So, but whoa, 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 the grace of God, yeah, the grace of God can, but the grace of God doesn't. And the grace of God didn't save them in Noah's day because he told them, I cannot strive with you, you've become mere flesh. When I started uh, going to college, we didn't have anybody running around with... Uh, uh, M1s or uh, other powerful rifles or pistols or uh, all kinds of other paraphernalia of, of death. We didn't have them running around killing people at the college or in the schools or on the street. That's a phenomenon of the last 30 years. In other words, I see a continual developmental sinfulness in our culture to the point that we've set the Bible aside. It's not relevant anymore. I went to a church conference the other day, and the guy was speaking, and he said, well, here's the Bible, okay? And so here's the book of Genesis. It tells about beginnings, and here's the prophets. It tells about the coming of Jesus, the first advent. And here's the gospel. It tells about the ministry of Jesus. And here's the epistles of Paul. It tells about the establishment of the first century church. Now, that's the Bible. So set it aside, and let's go on. I fell off of my seat. There were six or 7,000 young men and women in there striving for youth ministry and other aspects of church work. And here's this, this guy on the platform in his skinny jeans with tattoos all over his arms and uh, stuff shoved in his nose and all the places. And he's telling us, well, we know what the Bible says. It's not necessary anymore. Just lay it aside. Let's go on. Go on where? Go on to hell? If you reject this book, ladies and gentlemen, you can't be saved. Amen. That's probably the most important thing I'll say all week. If you reject this book, you cannot be saved. So it tells the truth about everything it t talks about, everything it includes. The abandonment of the Bible on any basis and for any reason produces a closing of the mind. All the recent founders and popularizers of evolutionism to the person are anti-biblical, anti-Christian, anti-church, Antichrist, and they loathe the people who profess Christianity or profess faith in God. Dr. My Michael Roos, a great evolutionist, very brilliant guy, a philosopher of science, said evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than a science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. Meaning and morality. Evolution is a religion. And so very quickly, Darwinism is the founding platform that promoted all anti-God ideologies the last 175 years. The number one platform, you see, Darwinism is the default position for atheism. All atheists use evolution for a basis of their belief. In other words, they disbelieve the authority of Bible because they think Darwin discovered some new thing. I stood right in front of the Linnaean Society when we made that documentary series back on the table called The War of the Ages, and we, we filmed all over Europe. I stood right in front of the Lane Society who gave Darwin priority for his model on evolution as if he's the guy who invented it, and he didn't invent it. He stole it from Alfred Russell Wallace, and most people don't know that unless you study the, the history of science. 
Darwin didn't even come up with the notion of divergence. He, he stole that. He plagiarized that from Wallace. That's the kind of guy that wrote The Origin of Species. He's a robber and a plagiarist. He gave nobody credit for He used their books just overwhelmingly at his urge or note, and he gave nobody credit for anything they wrote. So Darwinism is the default position for evolution, and it's based on falsehood. The survival of the fittest, success, and progress seen as merely a human endeavor. In other words, what we do today is what we can accomplish, and we can accomplish anything. I mean, we've gone, to the, we've gone into the heavens, we, we've walked on the moon. I mean, we, we can do anything, and we don't realize how utterly frail we are in the scheme of things. Recapitulationism, the notion that uh, in, our, in the womb of our mother, we go through all the stages of our evolutionary history. I'll talk about that in greater degree some night this week, maybe. The point is, Ernst Haeckel established that. That became a platform in uh, Hitler's Nazism, in Mussolini's fascism. That became a platform in American science today, that there is a recapitulationism, that we pass through the history of evolution in our nine months of gestation. There's no greater lie ever told. That's just the process of genetic fulfillment of who you are as an individual. It's not an evolutionary history. Western European superiority, so the, the notion that the white European male is the superior. And of course, Darwin is a white European male of upper class tradition. And the subtitle of The Origin of Species is the preservation of the favored races in the struggle for life. The classic racist was Darwin. Racism is not biblical. The Bible doesn't talk about races. It talks about the human race. Amen. Everybody in this room, I do not care the, the texture of your skin, everybody in this room are distantly related. We're all cousins. Amen. That's just how it is. We all came from Shem, Ham, or Japheth. There is no other alternative from a biblical perspective. And to say that in Mississippi is an incredible crown to me. I think I'll say it again. <laughs> We're all distant cousins. We all came from the genetic information that was re resonant in Noah and his wife, and he received that from Adam and Eve. There are not races of men. Now, there's ethnicities. That's another thing. That's our problem. But to blame that on racism is not a biblical reality or perspective. Amen. Homology, the idea that our ancestry possesses common ancestors and missing links, the reality is we've never discovered a common ancestor for which an airtight case can be made. There isn't any. Uh, manifest destiny, that drove us in this country to mistreat the Native Americans, and we Europeans owe them a great apology and much reparation because we felt like that we were, by God's will, destined to drive our ideology coast to coast, and we took the poor Creeks and, and Seminoles and Cherokees and Choctaws and all the people that lived right in this part of the world and drove them to the beautiful red clay of Oklahoma, the armpit of the nation. Took them out of this beautiful place all along the Tennessee Valley. Just took them and drove them out of there like we had the authority to do that. That's a part of this evolutionary intrusion that came from Europe, and it was a product of the French Revolution and not the Reformation. Our manifest destiny did that. And then the concessionary notions uh, for Genesis, and I'll talk about that in greater degree later this week. Uh, I've only got 15 minutes left, so I'll, I'll make a few uh, cons conciliatory conclusions and, and we'll say amen. But the concessionary alternatives for Genesis is a product of the church itself. In other words, we shot ourselves on our own foot thinking there's some scientific justification in the geologic age system, we harmonized our biblical literal position with ideas like the run reconstruction theory or the gap theory or theistic evolution or um, progressive creation or the day age theory or some of these notions where we devastate while we praise Jesus, we plunder him. The God that I serve can create the heavens and the earth in its present condition, in six 24-hour days, 6,000 years ago, that's no problem to me. 
I don't serve a God that needs billions of years. He didn't take billions of years. All you can get out of the Bible is 6,000 years. You can't get anything else out of it. Oh, you might be able to say uh, there might be two or 3,000 years in some, some uh, you know, some uh, vacancies in the genealogies or something like that. So, so we, we could say, I don't say it uh, personally, but you could say that you've got six to 10,000 years of chronology in the scripture, but you don't have a, a, a day more than 10,000 years. If you see some problems in the genealogy, I don't think there's any problems in the Bible at all, but the point is, uh, the idea of 13 to 15 billion years, where did that come from? You see, that is the part of the debate that doesn't make any sense to me, but that's the part of the debate that has created the problem. The big deal in, in 27 years of doing this ministry now, the big deal today is time, Okay, and the flood. Those are the big, highly contested biblical issues. Was there a worldwide mountain covering flood 4,358 years ago? Was there? If there was, then that justifies the reality that God who did that is pretty potent. Okay, he may be omnipotent. I think he is. So if there was a worldwide flood 4,300 years ago, if the creation was six 24 hour days in length, that means the God that we're serving has far more power than you can imagine. Amen. Just consider day three. He started on day three with a globe that was covered with water, and at the end of 24 hours, you had a soil, a soil horizon profile in which were trees and herbs and vegetables hanging on the tree, mature with seed and the fruit. 24 hours, you got peach trees mature with seeds in them. Wow. Adam, how old are you? I don't have any idea how old I am, but a couple seconds ago I was in the dust under that apple tree. Wow. Someone said, did Adam have a belly button? I don't really care. <laughs> but the point is, he wasn't attached to an umbilical cord. Have you ever thought about that? God said, you're done. <laughs> That's probably how it happened. So this is the passage I want to talk about, which deceives the whole world. I believe that's happened in the last 150 years, and I think it's going on in big time. John Agaret, he said in his history book, he said, it would have been remarkable indeed in the intellectual ferment of the late 19th century had not affected men's ideas about the meaning of life, the truth of revealed religion, moral values, and similar fundamental problems. So he's talking about what Darwinism did to these kinds of ideas. He said, in particular, the theory of evolution so important in altering contemporary views of science, history, and social relations produced significant changes in American thinking about religious and philosophical questions. Evolution posed an immediate challenge to religion. If Darwin was correct, the biblical account of creation is obviously untrue. Now that's the war. That's the war we're fighting today. And it is an incredible war. Dr. Morris said, this could be my last slide, Dr. Morris said in the conclusion of his book, and it's back there on the table, of all the books back on the, on the table, The Long War Against God is probably by far the most important book if you can only buy one, okay? Far more important. And you should read it three or four times. If I was in charge of a, a Christian school, that I, and I have been in the past, but if I was in charge the 11th and 12th graders would read that book and write a paper on it every year. That's how vital that book is in understanding the nature of this problem. The denial of God rejecting the reality of supernatural creation and the creator's sovereign rule of the world has always been the root cause of every human problem. This evolutionary, humanistic, pantheistic, even atheistic worldview has taken many different forms over the ages Varying with time and culture. But Dr. Morris says, and I agree with him, but it has always been there in one guise or another because the origin of evolution was Satan himself. That got him thrown out of heaven. Read Genesis 3. The two vital prognostications or statements of evolution is there. He denied the authority of God and he denied the deity of the eternal God. 
the two things that evolution always does. It denies the sovereignty of God and the authority of this book. That's an evolutionary system. And that's the only reason it was developed. Its notion of being a scientific model is nonsense. I will show you this week, it has not been used in the last 150 years to do anything scientific. They didn't use it in the advancement of biology. They didn't use it in the advancement of geology. They didn't use it in the advancement of anything. It was not used to fly a rocket ship. Darwinism adds nothing to science. Amen. Are you doing okay? Amen. Some, of you, I mean, some of you look shocked and spellbound in some kind of way. But it's always been there in one form or another to turn the minds and hearts of the people away from their maker. There has indeed been an age-long war against God. It has been going on from the beginning of time because it was, it was developed in the heart of Satan himself. And you see it in the temptation of Eve because the two things he did was deny the authority of the Creator and the authority of his word. It has been going on from the beginning of time and will increase in intensity these last days. And so evolutionism will only be more glorified as we go forward. And we will be completely uh, reduced as a body of believers to a group of, of, of believers in a remnant. Because uh, we're seeing the reduction of the true believer uh, in great significance today because of evolution. And so this week we're going to talk about these ideas. We all have a bias. How many in this room has a bias? If you don't raise your hand, you're lying. Everybody in this room is biased, and your biases are 100%. All biases are 100%. If you're an atheist, that is 100% bias. If you're an evidential uh, theistic believer, that is 100% bias. If you believe in agnosticism, that's 100% bias. You can't start thinking about design and still remain agnostic. In other words, these are 100% biases, and they're based on preconsistent, uh, preconceived ideas. And so I'm going to show you some fossil material and some, some uh, models, some, some very uh, significant models made off of fossils. This guy is Stan, found in Harding County, South Dakota in about the 1990s, and it's a very significant uh, T-Rex, probably the third largest in the world. We'll talk about that greater tonight. But th that's a, a replication of the fossil, and it's, it's used for research. That's how well it's done. Uh, that's a fossil egg of an Edmontosaur, and that's an Edmontosaur skull. So that rascal came out of that egg. So when we say that these animals were on the ark, there's no problem. Because when they were born, they weighed about a pound and a half. Isn't that neat? When that rascal was born, hatched out of an egg, he was about the size of a shepherd dog. And when God put them on the ark, he put young on the ark for the purpose of reproduction. That's the nature of this argument. So we all use the same evidence, we just interpret it differently. And so this whole week is going to be explaining to you why the naturalist interprets the evidence from a naturalistic perspective and why the creationist interprets the same evidence from a biblical perspective. So it's about interpretation. Why do you interpret the evidence the way you do? That's based on your worldview. Got five minutes. So evolution is a preconceived bias based on the same data. Creation is a preconceived bias based on the same data. I look at this animal and I think creation day six. Is day, yeah, day six. <laughs> when do you think dinosaurs were created if they were made on day? I mean, terrestrial creatures, when were they made? There any other time in the Bible for them to be made except on day six. So Adam and Eve lived with them in the garden until the fall, you know, they just used their teeth to eat apples. If indeed they had teeth, I believe when they were cursed, God genetically manipulated them. I think genetic manipulation is a part of the curse. I don't believe God created mosquitoes to, to suck the blood of Adam. I don't believe that happened. I believe it was a perfect garden and mosquitoes were there. They ate something else. I don't believe flies got in his picnic basket. I don't believe termites ate the handle out of his rowboat. I, I don't think that happened if he had a rowboat. I believe those things are the result of the curse. Amen. 
Now, Noah had a problem maybe with termites. He had to do something with them. I'm not sure. Maybe woodpeckers. Maybe. But the point is this. The same data, completely 180 degree different interpretation. And so what I want to talk about this week is the paganization of America. How did this happen? How did evolution produce this effect? Because this is killing us in this nation. It's impacting the church. In fact, everybody in this room has been evolutionized to some degree. You have questions about the authority of Scripture. Because you can't believe Genesis, you can't believe some other things. And I'm telling you right now, and I'm closing with this. Genesis is the base authority for everything we believe. If you can't believe Genesis 1, 1, okay, if you can't believe that, just like it says, then how do you believe John 3, 16? Because John 3, 16 is based on Genesis 1, 1. The creator of the world became the savior of the world. If he was not the creator, he's not the savior.